Well, hello, this is Pastor Ken Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida, and I'm inviting you to worship with us on Sunday. Every Sunday at 8.30 and 10.30, you can come in person because proper precautions are being made, and you can worship online by going to trinitydelray.org slash live. And you can join our Bible study Sundays at 10 a.m. I find it easier to go to the, to the what? I find it easier to go to the iPad, YouTube. And in YouTube, I search for trinitydelray.org. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I don't know if you know how to subscribe. You can subscribe to... Um, trinitydelray.org and then when you do that yes. and click on one of your subscriptions you kind of have to figure out how to do that I can't tell you here and then um, you'll have all of the videos listed I don't know if they're always in chronological order but sometimes they are and that's just a, a long-winded way of saying use YouTube to get to it easily instead of going to the trinitydelray.org website. That is easier for me. Okay, enough of that. And the Bible study is here in the same, it can be found in the same way. Well, you know, you can demonstrate that much easier than you can talk about it. So that is our opening slide questions. Who is Jesus? You know, in Bible study, a man taught me once that when he goes to study the Bible, he comes with his questions. Not to question the Lord and his word, no, but to ask of the word that is displayed, what are we looking for here? Why am I reading this at all? And I find it true that if I read over a passage rather quickly to get the, the general overview, and then go back and read it verse by verse and phrase by phrase and then word by word that I receive more of a blessing out of that than if I just read it quickly to get it out of the way. That might be helpful to you. Well, we're looking at this question, who is Jesus? Jesus, the true God and true man, what the Bible says about the word made flesh, the word made flesh, not just at Christmas, but throughout his lifetime of approximately 33 years, Jesus was shown to be the Son of God with power. And on the 6th of January, some of the world celebrates a second Christmas, uh, sometimes called the Christmas of the Gentiles, because it was on the celebration of Epiphany, about two years after his birth, if you do the chronology in Matthew, you can do that. Um, you can find the wise men not at the manger scene as everybody has it, but, oh, but two years later, and he was in a house. I don't know what house, we aren't told. But we know from Matthew that Herod gave the they uh, Herod gave the uh, the wise men gave Herod the information, and they were in Jerusalem. You see, you make the connection there, and the pertinent verse for Epiphany is this: and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. And then, opening their treasures, they gave him the gifts that every child knows who has ever been in a Christmas program, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Well, the artist has shown this. You see a child there, not newborn, but I think uh, the the artist intended to show a child of about two years old. 
Topic. Maybe a little less, maybe 18 months. But the word about should be used of his age. Why two years? Well, Herod wanted to kill all the boys in that were two years old and younger because he knew the chronology. That's where we get the two years, two years old and under. And so we can say somewhere between a year and two years and not be wrong. But no age is given. Do you understand? Epiphany, the Christmas of the Gentiles, when these who were not Jews came and worshipped him. Do you have any questions about that? No. Anybody? Okay. Epiphany. Well, I guess we'll start the timer now. <laughs> Let's go on. You know the second article of the creed, don't you? And we had this on the on the screen uh, a few weeks ago. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son. And the bullet points are those. What should you say? Um, the points that are summarized about Jesus' life: conceived, born, crucified died, buried, and that should be uh, suffered under Pontius Pilate. That's a mistake there. That should be suffered under Pontius Pilate, and then was crucified, dead, and buried, and descended into hell, rose again from the dead, ascended, and sits, and he will come a... Oh, wait a minute. There's, there's something that's not in the creed. And that's the point of our lesson today. That's the point of the lesson. In between his ascension and sitting with all power and glory to given to him at the right hand of God. In between that and coming again to judge. There's all this history. 2,000 years of history and counting. How many more years? Well, that's we're going to get into that. That's the question that you all have, I think, is, well, is he coming today or tomorrow, or in, will it be another 767 years? I just made that number up because I don't know. But he will come and judge, and he will judge both those who are alive at his coming and those who have died. All will be raised, and there will be a separation. That's another subject but it will be the work of Jesus. Well, you know the creed, right? No. Well, this is the question. Jesus still lives. What is he doing now? What is Jesus doing now? Just, just sitting? Well, so let's get into the question by reading some Bible passages. May I ask Judy to read Matthew 28. Uh, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Never forget that promise. I am with you. Always. What was he named according to the prophet Isaiah? What was he named? It could Emmanuel. Say, Emmanuel. And that means God with you. God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. And Jesus makes the promise literally, I am with you always. The end of the age is the end of this age before the age of glory when the believers will be brought to him and see him face to face in person. Wow. I am with you. Never forget that promise. He still lives mm -hmm. to be with us. He still lives to intercede, to rule, to judge, and to forgive. Those words are important. 
to intercede, to rule, to judge, wow, and to forgive. Another reader, please, uh, 1 Timothy 2. Joanne, are you up? I'm up. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men. He's a mediator between us and the Father. Two, now what does he mediate? Disagreements? Sort of. What does he mediate? Our sin. Our sins. He prays that our sins be forgiven and they are and the father always accepts that intercession i don't think we think about his intercession for us as much as we might but he is the only one that is the mediator we need mediators in our life when there's a disagreement between two parties, the judge will sometimes appoint a mediator. In fact, in many contracts today, you probably are aware of this. There is a clause that says, we won't go to court, we will agree to a mediation. All right. Well, why do they do that? Why do they put that clause in a contract that I agree that we will have a mediation, not uh, not go to court in a lawsuit? Less expensive. Pardon? Pardon? Less expensive. Costs. I can't hear too many words there. I was going to say monetary wise, sometimes it's uh, less costly. Uh, right. Uh, warring partners, uh, partner. Uh, warring parties like to throw things at each other suits and counter suits and and demands and it all goes public you know because a court case in most cases i don't practice law but i know and don't you also know that um it goes public it becomes a matter of public record unless the judge has a reason to seal it so some people don't really want it to go public. It's messy and it spoils reputations, don't you know? And uh, so we have a mediator between us and the father and his name is Jesus and his intercession is always accepted. Okay. You could say that the father has decided not to bring a suit against us. He would surely win. And we plead for mercy. We have, I didn't put that passage in there, but do you know that passage from 1 John about the mediator? We have an advocate with the father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. The word advocate is used in some languages instead of the word for lawyer. And if you want a good lawyer, <laughs> you can't do better than, than Jesus, our advocate. All right? An advocate is one, ad, uh, two, and a vocatio that has uh, the meaning of uh, one who speaks. Speaks for you. Yes, he speaks for us. We have an advocate yes. with the Father. Advocate you. So you can learn a little Latin here once in a while when I remember a little. There is one God and there is one mediator between God and man. And really, I made a mistake there. I should have the comma. Uh, Jesus Christ is in the context Jesus still lives to intercede, to rule, to judge, and to forgive. And I put there a crown. In the church year, we sometimes celebrate the last Sunday of the church year as Jesus ruling as king over his kingdom. Would someone read Hebrews 2? Hebrews 2, 8, 9. Now in... Putting everything in subjection to him, 
He left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Subjection. Well, what is the law in this passage? What is uh, the law idea here? What is the word subjection? Yeah. So that is, uh, people don't like being in subjection, generally speaking, do they? Subjection. Would you like to be in subjection under a domineering person? No. <laughs> uh, but the Father has put everything in subjection to Jesus and left absolutely nothing outside his control. But wait a minute. At present, and this is a big wow, I think this is a gospel passage, and I'll tell you why in a minute. At the present time, we don't see everything under Jesus' subjection, do we? What, what's going on in the world? Oh, well, read the news. Oh. We don't see everything in subjection to Jesus. Have you noticed that? No. Uh, would, you, would you say free will is going on? No, uh, the exercise okay. of free will tends to sin. And that's the general statement. That's actually what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, of course. And what's what kinds of things go on in the world that show us that not everything at the present time is in subjection to him. When they cancel out, when they cancel out uh, religion, period. When there is an effort to take away our freedom of worship, when there are efforts to cancel, <laughs> and that's a political word now, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well. I don't do politics, as you know. I have a firm rule. Uh, do it privately with you anytime you want. But in, in this Bible study, I'm studying the Bible. And it, what happens is that what the Bible says comes right alongside of what's going on now. Mm -hmm. And it judges. The scriptures judge what's going on now. And what's going on now is so much and so many people who refuse to be subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what you, you mentioned, Chris, you mentioned uh, the exercise of free will, which tends to sin. My, my free will tends to sin, too, and so does yours. But the, the comfort in that pas passage, the, the second sentence, is a recognition that until Jesus comes in glory, it's going to be this way. Sorry about that. But the comfort is that, oh, this is, it's normal. It's normal for not having everything in subjection to Jesus. It's a normality that the Lord doesn't want, but it's the normality of sin. And you can read about that in Romans chapter 3. There is not one who is righteous. No, not one. Everyone is unrighteous according to their sinful nature. So people we refuse. And in if you read the commands of Jesus Christ, summarized in love one another as I've loved you. If you read the commands of Jesus, you're going to find out that you have parts of your lives, all of you, that are not in subjection to Jesus. And I think you and I would say, well, by the grace of God, I'm, I'm working on that. I've got a lot to work to do. I don't want any funny remarks here. It's just true. So let's be honest with God. You might as well be. You can't lie to him. He knows the truth. He knows all about you. 
So I think this is when you pray for help. Because you have a mediator. And because you have a forgiving God. Am I making a point here? Yes, yes. All right. So for the time being, we will acknowledge the fact that we live in a world that is not, mostly speaking, in subjection to Jesus. Jesus still lives to intercede, to rule, to judge, and to forgive. We're going to talk about another one of those words in John 5. Will you read it, please, someone? John 5, 27. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. That judgment goes on uh, in a general way now. But I think that in the ultimate sense, this passage would refer to the judgment at the end of time. We're not talking about that right now. When Jesus judges, he judges righteously. He cannot do otherwise. Jesus still lives to intercede, to rule, to judge, and to forgive. Oh, yes. Let's, let's concentrate. Well, don't we want that, that last verb? To forgive. B, are you up for Matthew 9? Is, is D still there? Uh, I don't see her. Would someone else read Matthew 9, 6? Uh, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Now that occurred when they let this man down through the roof in the house. That's quite a scene. And he said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And they had a big argument with Jesus about whether he should have healed on the Sabbath. He has authority to forgive. And he earned by his death and resurrection the authority to forgive because he took upon himself the sins of all people. And to this day, the Son of Man has authority to forgive. Thank you, Lord, for being a forgiving God. You didn't, you didn't have to. But you did. Jesus still lives to intercede, to rule, to judge, and to forgive. Um, I'll do it. Go ahead. John 5, 21 to 23. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sends him. There's a lot in that passage. I'm going to concentrate on the one point that I've underlined, that the Father gave the authority to do the judging. The judging occurs because of sin, and the judgment would be eternal death. But because of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, there is the mercy of God when he forgives for the sake of that punishment meted out on his son. And so the son has authority to exercise the judgment, not according to the law, but according to the gospel that says, I forgive, I forgive. I forgive. I forgive you all your sins. Of course, that is based on the fact that you don't do the same sin again. Um, or something like that. How does that work? How does that work? Well, I'm going to admit to you, and I think you will admit to me and to one another, that there are things that you have done that are wrong. Little things, big things. 
All sins are damnable. And some you did intentionally. I hope not many. Once they have been forgiven. So here you are on the second day of the new year. And um, maybe you have committed a sin yesterday or today. And along about March the 4th or 5th or 6th, you commit that sin again. We are, we are likely to commit the same sin. And I want to include, of course, the sins of omission. The things you failed to do that you could have done today, you will again in this year forget to do those things again. Mm -hmm. Repetitive sin is an awful thing. Especially if it becomes a habit, an addiction, a regular part of your life. You know, I, you know, pastors don't like to be harsh. Uh, we would like to be loved and popular and accepted. And so we thought if I'm harsh with these children, ages zero to 100, all children, that they will go away. They will not come to our church. And I know that happens. You see what I'm getting at? That the repetitive sin is likely. Uh, read Romans 7. Paul is saying, I have been guilty of repetitive sin. The things that I would not do, those I find myself doing. It's a present participle, which means he keeps on doing them, O wretched man that I am. You find comfort in Romans 7, but don't stay there. As I've said to you more than once, five or six times I've said to you, don't stay in Romans 7, go on to Romans 8 and read the gospel of forgiveness there. Paul does when he writes it. But my point here is that Chris, it will be true that we sin again, the same sin. Now, some denominations in the United States, I will not name them, some denominations in the world um, speak of uh, sin in a way that makes it minimized. And that's a difficulty. I don't want to stay on this point too long, but I'm trying to sharpen your question and make it general to all of us. Well, being nice isn't the way, not that you say it goes on, but consequences will, will uh, eventually come out because yes. the Lord gives out consequences, not all love. And, you know. Some sins will have consequences now and continually. Uh, some consequences will be instantaneous and they'll be over with. You know, kind of like a spanking. <laughs> the Lord spanks us. Hebrews 12. I hope you don't mind my little short jabs at a Bible verse or chapter, but I don't have time to go to every little tangent. They're important tangents. And I know you don't know those by heart, so I may be may I'm a little unfair when I do that. The father judges no one, but he gives judgment to his son, and for the sake of that sacrifice forgives. Let's end with the gospel on that one. Jesus ascended into heaven, and you know the passage where the angel says what? Who's going to read that? Judy, back around to you. Okay. Um, Acts 1.11, the angel said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The Ascension, celebrated how many days after Easter? Oh, so I 90 days, right? 
No, good guess. Is it 41? It's 40. 40. Oh. And then 10 days later, what feast is celebrated? The Feast of Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50th. And because the first and last days are counted, it's a way to get a little extra interest. Because the first and last days are counted in that system, not as we would count it, we would say it would be 49 days later. That's true, it is. Because there are 49 days after Easter. 49 days after Easter. Well, why is it the 50th? It's the 50th day counting the first and last days. Got it? Yeah. Okay, so you got the chronology. Easter, 40 days later, Ascension. 10 days after that, Pentecost. Peter's sermon. We ought to have a timeline. <laughs> then this Jesus will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Uh, when is that going to be? On the last day. Yes. <laughs> well, when I is the last day? Judgment day. Judgment Day. And when is Judgment Day? I'm being pertinent. Uh, Any time. <laughs> okay, that's right. When? The disciples wanted to know, and so they asked Jesus directly. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Now, the question they were asking was, was twofold. One is this destruction of, Jesus, of Jerusalem, which Jesus had been predicting in rather stark and awful detail. They wanted to know when. If I had been there, I would have asked that question, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like to know? Would you want to be around when the walls are are destroyed and all of the structures in Jerusalem are destroyed and there's no more worship place and, and the people are scattered. When will these things be? What's the answer? I want you to look at Mark chapter 13, which is a little bit later after 13, four. It's in the same speech of Jesus. Would someone read this, please, Mark 13? When, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Stay awake. Stay awake. Kind of like, uh, it's, it's hard to do. Now, awake has nothing to do with, uh, with sleeping. As we lay our head down on pillow for six or seven or eight or nine hours every night, we hope. In yep. these days, I consider sleep to be a wonderful gift for which I pray. But here, staying awake means Stay awake in the, in the faith. Uh, keep on believing. Uh, do not fall away uh, from what uh, you have been called to. No, no one knows. And if you don't know, you have to be awake. The parable is, is, is told by Jesus at this point about uh, the, what I say to you. the master of the house going away and the servants have to be awake when he is when he returns and blessed are those whom uh, the master finds the servants uh, awake and doing his will when he comes that's what it means to stay awake to not only believe but keep on doing what jesus has has ordered you to do or told you to do you don't have a choice here I'm going to do my own will instead of his will. Who, whatever, what Christian says that? 
not intentionally, I hope. <laughs> but the point of this passage that I've ra la laid out for you here is you don't know when. There are, have been many, hundreds, maybe thousands of people in the past 2,000 years who have tried to predict the day. They have calculators, they have read Daniel and Revelation, and they have uh, taken this thing and uh, th those passages and laid them along Matthew 25, and they have tried to determine the day and the hour. Well, maybe not the hour. Pastor, so yeah. I was re reading the, um, the Lutheran Study Bible, and it, it shocked me to find, I, I might have talked with you separately about this, but um, it has a whole page on false teachers or prophets, whichever you want to call them. Yeah. Because they predicted the, uh, and the end, you know, this, uh, the coming of the, of the Father and uh, or of Jesus. And so they're in the Lutheran study Bible as false prophets because they did this. And a, a couple of them are beloved by people I know. And, and I actually mentioned it to them that it's in the Lutheran. And uh, they didn't really give me any answer. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't say to them, it's in the Lutheran study Bible. I, will, I would say to them simply this passage, you don't know. Yes. Yes, and, and that's they, enough because, they, yeah, uh, Matthew, they say that also both of them, uh, or they say that also that that you know that that they they know that, but they didn't know that these people prophesized that that was not published as much in the present day as it was when they did it. Ah, uh, right. Yes, I haven't thought of that. That's an important point to say. Well, we're not going to tell them. Well. I don't know why people insist on knowing. I, you know, my philosophy is all I have is today. Yeah. Right. I know that, that Jesus knows my future. Uh, the, the Lord knows my past and has forgiven it. He has taken care of my future because he's taken care He's promised, uh, has many promises that comfort me about the future. Why should I worry about tomorrow? Jesus says, tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. <laughs> and Charlie Brown says, that's for sure. Yeah. Charles Schultz often brought the Bible in a very covert way into his comic strips. There's a whole book called The Gospel According to, to Peanuts, but it wasn't written by Charles Schultz, but it incorporates those. Mm -hmm. Oh, we ought to do that sometime, but I, it's a big copyright thing. Uh, we have to move on. You know, I thought I was going to finish this today, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know how it is. Jesus still lives to intercede, to rule, to judge, and to forgive. He is fixed today. Well, you know what? Uh, there's a context problem here. Uh, because Acts 17 is not does not have Jesus as the subject. And how I can tell, he has fixed a day. That's the subject of the sentence. The verb is fixed. Okay. He's fixed by a man whom he has pointed. And that means that this is speaking of the Father. Oh, okay. All right. If I had given... Acts 17 is Paul in uh, on, on that hill speaking the philo to the philosophers in Athens about the unknown God. And he is telling them about the God they don't know because they had one statue that doesn't have a name and they worshiped that God that they didn't know. Imagine that. Imagine having a whole religion based on worshiping the God you, you don't know. What? Anyway, the, the father that you can know, uh, Paul is saying, has fixed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And we know about that appointment 
in other Bible verses, right? And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. There's another part of the sentence that proves that it's not the, not the son as the subject of this sentence. I'm very much of a grammarian, you know that, and I hope that doesn't bother you. I just know that if you understand the English language, you're looking, looking at the subject and the verb, you're trying to find out who the subject is, and that's the father, enough of that. So there will be a day on which Jesus will judge the world in righteousness. That's my only point here. Jesus still lives to destroy the slavery to sin. Uh, you want to reflect on this? Read 1 Peter 2.24 somewhat. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. By his wounds, you've been healed. That's the gospel motivation. The motivation to do what? To die to sin. It's the same dying to sin that Paul speaks about in Romans chapter 7. Don't be a slave to sin, but be a slave to righteousness. <laughs> why, why would you want to be a slave to sin? It's an awful life. None of you, I, I don't believe, none of you are in that category. But God's will is that we might die to sin. Dying to sin means when I see it coming, I say no. It's, it's called run fast. <laughs> <laughs> when the devil and the world and the flesh combine or individually say to you, come on, let's have a little fun. Sin is not fun. And when it becomes uh, a, your, sir, your, your uh, master, when sin is your master, then you're really in trouble. And our, our effort is to daily die to sin, act as though it isn't there, and live to righteousness. Jesus still lives to destroy this slavery to sin. John 8, 34, 36. Who would read that? Jesus answered them. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Thank you, Evelyn. The son sets you free. You see the gospel message in that? If a particular habit of yours tends to repeat. Well, it might be the way you talk about others yeah. with your own self-righteousness on parade. Yes. Because you're always comparing. It's a terrible thing inside of us that we're always comparing ourselves with others. What? No. Compare yourself to Jesus. Now you know where you, now you, know where you stand. But his, his, his will, the, what, what God really wants for you is to be set free from slavery to sin. Who, this, everyone who practices sin, the translation is designed to bring out something that keeps on going on and going on and going on, habitual, practices sin. And then you're a slave to that. And the slave doesn't remain in the house. We're talking about the collection of believers here. All right. Jesus still lives to grant the gift of eternal life to all who believe in him. You know, the John 3.16 passage is so well known and so, so advertised. You know, we're talking about one thing in our lesson today, and that is, what is Jesus still doing for us? He is still living yeah. to give us 
this gift, and it's entirely a gift, not something we earn or deserve. Ephesians 3, 8 and 9. We can't say it together because of, at least I haven't figured out how to Zoom with all of us speaking in unison. God loved us so much that he gave his son. Someone said recently that this is a great passage for, for Christmas. Why? Why would it be a good passage to preach on for Christmas? Well, it provides hope. The word gave. Oh, gave, okay. This is the gift of Christmas. The gift gave. The father said, here's my son. Take him. It was his present to us. Yeah. And if you believe in Jesus, you have eternal life. To believe in Jesus is to know him and to know what he has done for you and still does, has done and still does for you. What is Jesus doing now is the question we're answering. What? Someone should read it, though. <laughs> oh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I say to you, you have it. You have eternal life. Someday you will see what that means. And so will I. By God's grace, we will be kept in the one true faith. Jesus still lives to give us rest and peace even now. Here's the rest passage. Someone read of Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. I will. Uh, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Oh, how I need some rest. Yeah. The mother with four children and the father is not at home really needs rest. But so does the mother who has a husband, and they both work hard. And they never seem to get any rest. So does the retiree who can't get any sleep at night because of pain or because someone, a child or grandchild has trouble. And they, have, <laughs> they don't have rest. Rest means to be free from all worry and to be free from the sin that oppresses. Take my burden upon you, for my burden is light. And come to me. That's an invitation. If I ever heard one, Jesus saying to us, come to me. If you are laboring and heavy laden over your sin, I'm going to give you rest so that you can live as a forgiven child instead of a child who is afraid of judgment day is coming upon you. If, if judgment day rules over you in, in a fearsome way, I say to you, come to Jesus. And this is the rest he's talking about. Not just a good night's sleep. <laughs> now, the guilty conscience doesn't have a good night's sleep. If you find yourself accused in the middle of the night by something you've done or failed to do, I, uh, here's my advice. Confess it to Jesus and ask for his forgiveness. And believe that you have that forgiveness. And now go back to sleep. Remember when you were a child and you were afraid and you cried and someone, your mom or dad, maybe an older brother or sister, someone came and tucked you back in. Rest. Now, now let's talk about peace. Read um, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as, as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, 
neither let them be afraid. Peace be with you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Peace is what the world is expecting at Christmas. And they look around and say, we don't have it. And we're talking about your peace. Yes. The peace that resides inside of you. This is not the peace between nations when they declare an armistice and they lay down their weapons. This is the peace that you have inside of you when you know that the father has, because of the son, laid down his weapons of eternal death against you and, and said, I forgive you. That, that's the peace that Jesus gives that no one else can give. The world tries to give you peace, but they can't. They cannot give you peace for this. Let not your hearts be troubled. Say it's our faith peace or our spiritual peace. Yes. Uh, and um, regardless of what's going on in the world around us, nobody can take that personally away from us. We always have that with us as long as we cling, cling to it. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's well said. Thank you, Judy. Jesus still lives as our prophet, priest, and king. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It's a long passage. Uh, the, Lord, the Lord Jesus is taking passages from the prophet Isaiah and saying, in effect, I am the one who has been prophesied. The good news to the poor or the poor in spirit that are mentioned, that Jesus mentions in Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 5, the uh, Beatitudes. Liberty to the captives is not the people in jail. <laughs> All those in jail need this too, because if you are captive to sin, he frees you from that captivity. Sight to the blind. The blind are those who do not know how much God loves them, how much he hates their sin, but has forgiven it. Those are the true Blind people. You can read about that in John 8, and we did when we studied the miracles of Jesus. He gave sight to the blind, but he was using that as a metaphor for those who are blind. And the, the unbelieving leaders said, are we blind? <laughs> uh, the judgment was against them at that moment. And to liberty, uh, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. The oppression is not the oppression of governments. So many people take this passage out of context and use it for a, uh, a political end. No, the oppressed that Jesus is talking about here are the people oppressed by their own sin and, and by the sins of others. But primarily, the devil oppresses those who are still unbelieving people. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now that's a little more difficult to explain. Well, there was a time, and if you read Leviticus 25, if you really want to look, uh, look this up in detail, read uh, the Jubilee year. The Jubilee year happened after seven sevens. And after seven sevens, you arrive at the 50th day. <laughs> you understand? You understand the connection now in, a, in an oblique way between that and the 50th, as we were talking about, on Pentecost. Because the year of the Lord's favor occurs when he has sent the Holy Spirit and given faith to those believing ones on that day and over 3,000. Well, go back to this passage to proclaim 
Jesus was said to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the Jubilee year. And what happened in the Jubilee year was that the those who were in debt, there's <laughs> this is a wonderful thing. Uh, their debts were forgiven. And those who had mortgages had, um, they were able to return to their own land, which they had mortgaged out to someone else. Well, wait a minute, there was still money owed. Well, they worked out a pro rata, a pro rata uh, amount according to the number of years that the, that the mortgagee, got me? The one who was under the mortgage had, had occupied the land. That's a little complicated. You leave it to the closing agent to figure that out. See, on the 50th day, the slaves were released. They were no longer slaves. That was the year of the Lord's favor. And all of this happens. See, all of that is a metaphor for what happens now in the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor is for each individual when faith claims Jesus Christ as Savior. And it happens in a magnificent way, in a complete way, when the Lord comes. The Lord's favor is his grace. That's another word, which means he's giving something that we didn't earn or deserve. Now, that's an awful lot in one couple of verses, isn't it? But that's what Jesus lives to give us. I'll bet. It's been, I bet it's rare that you've ever heard a sermon on, on that passage. Maybe once, maybe twice in your whole lifetime. I've never taught it in a Bible class. Jesus still lives as our prophet, priest, and king, keeping an eye on the, on the time elapsed here. It was fitting that we should have such a high priest. Who's that? Jesus. Holy? Yes, he was. Innocent? Completely. Unstained? The perfect lamb of God. Without blemish or stain. Separated from sinners. Separated in the sense that he didn't join with them in their sin and exalted above the heavens. That's his ascension. We have a high priest. Jesus still lives as our prophet, priest, and king. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Do you believe that? Yes. Yes. Definitely. Yes. yes. This is Paul speaking. No, no, this is me. I'm, say, I'm speaking this. I am saying I know that he will bring mm. me safely into his heavenly kingdom. That's his good and gracious will. He loves me and gave his son for me. And I'll say with Paul, to him be the glory. Because it's not something I've earned or deserved or done. It's a wonderful promise for you to write down that he's going to rescue from every evil deed. Some days it's hard to believe that. But I want that for you. I want you to have this faith that you can all say, yes, he will bring me. Personal pronoun. Are you getting this? Are you loving this? This is a wonderful thing. Jesus still lives. What's he doing now? Who is Jesus? That's our question. The question we started off with about 13 weeks ago, if I, my count is right. How, how do you answer the question, who is Jesus? Here's how you can answer the question, who is Jesus? You can read the four Gospels. If you add them up, there are 89 chapters in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, the total number of chapters in these four Gospels. If you read a chapter a day, some chapters are rather long. 
If you read a chapter a day, you can read the Gospels in three months. And someone added up the words. I don't know, who counts words? Well, I, I know how to do it. Uh, 18,000 and 11,000 and 19,000 and 15,000 words. If you read those in three months, about 65,000 words, and you can say, oh, wow, that's a lot of words. <laughs> you know how many words are in the average novel? Between 50 and 90,000. I was just going to say somewhere around the same amount. <laughs> and, and you, if you get interested in a novel, you know, the page turner, I couldn't put it down. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you've ever read a novel, I'll bet you've read a novel in less than a month because you get locked into it. You keep on reading. You don't just read one chapter. You don't get anything else done. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, people do that today, as they say. I, I was, I'm binge watching this, and uh, you know, Janie and I have discovered how how that happens. Is that at the end of an episode, the thing keeps on rolling. It goes right into the next episode. Yeah, you can watch the whole series, ten years of series. <laughs> <laughs> speaking from experience well my point is is that it is not impossible to answer the question who is jesus by reading what he had his people write about him i i think reading like that you don't get it i i happen to be fortunate and i'm grateful to be in two bible classes one is doing john and they're taking six months <laughs> Yeah, and the other is going to be doing Mark. I start it next week, um, and um, I, I don't know how long that's going to take. Uh, probably eight, eight or nine weeks. But, yeah. but the six month one is so in depth. I love it. Well, uh, maybe when you were away, uh, maybe one of you remembers how long it took us to study uh, uh, John, and we did it thematically. I know it was. Yeah. I might have been away, yes. It took yeah. us a long time to do Romans, too. Oh, I remember. oh yes. We, I think we were almost a year in Romans, and it's only yeah. 13 chapters. What? No. 16. So, 16 chapters in Romans. I'm just saying to you that if you're not on a Bible reading program, and don't beat yourself up about it. You, yeah. If you skip three days, you don't have to go back and try to catch up. No one is putting a whip to you. You just... Now, you make another point, though. If you read this fast, a chapter a day, you're not getting the same thing as when you take four days to read one chapter. Yes. You're getting a different reading. And so the Bible does not make any laws for you. Does There's nothing in the, in the Bible about a Bible reading program. If something helps you to know Jesus and his will and uh, to, to know the, the law against you and the gospel for you. What, just do what is comfortable for. Don't stay away for three months. Please don't do that. But find yourself finding joy in the world. I, I don't want to fill up this part of the with empty words. Now, you saw this, and that's a welcome sight to you. That means <laughs> <laughs> there's no more slides. It's not that we couldn't have put more slides, but we are at the end of an hour. And I, I have enjoyed this time with you in, in asking the question, who is Jesus? And, uh, and we can do it again sometime, as the Lord wills. I have another plan in mind for next time. I'm not going to tell you what it is because it isn't done yet. I don't promise what I can't deliver. But I pray for you and ask you to pray for me as I study in order. Lord, this is a prayer that I've had many times. Teach me that I may be a teacher of others. Teach me that I may be a teacher of others so pray for me that i might teach you what the bible says and to apply it to our lives if you don't do the second part what good is it i know that 
the Lord applies himself to my life and to yours. So we pray together. Lord God, uh, we thank you that you have brought your son into full view by these studies of the scriptures. And we ask you to continue to enliven our faith by a study of your word and to love what it is. And even when we don't understand what you've said, bring understanding and application, repentance of our sins and faith in Jesus, your son. And grant that if we have the opportunity, that we take the opportunity to say a word about you to those who do not know you or do not know you fully in the face of Jesus Christ, whom you have revealed to us in Christmas and Epiphany and in all the seasons of our lives. We pray this for each other in the name of Jesus. And all Amen. of God's people said what? Amen. 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 Let it let it be so. Let it be so. Amen.